recording. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, for coming for our weekly seminar. Um, this week we are hosting Dr. Sebastian Watt from the School of Geography, Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of Birmingham in the UK. Um, Dr. Watt's research investigates the physical and chemical processes that control the behavior of long-term developments of volcanoes. After completing a um, PhD at the, at the University of Oxford, investigating explosive eruptions records in southern Chile, he moved to Southampton to study volcanic landslides processes offshore Montserrat in the Caribbean and was a NERC postdoctoral research fellow there from 2011. He then moved uh, back to the UK to the University of Birmingham in 2013. Most of his research currently focuses on volcanism in subduction zones. Current projects include tefer chronological reconstructions of past exclusive, exclusive eruptions and investigations of large scale volcanic landslides and their associated hazards. Much of his research is based on fieldwork, including projects in central Mexico, Papua New Guinea, and Indonesia. Several of these projects are cross-disciplinary, combining physical and chemical analysis of volcanic samples with modeling and geo geophysical data set to investigate volcanic processes. Dr. Watt's research also draws upon marine data and observation in research and he has participated in recent expedition of Sean Montserrat and Ritter Island in Papua New Guinea. He was awarded at the, in 2014 by the EGO Arm Richter Award and the Murchison Fund for the Geological Society in 2015. So um, today, Dr. Watt is going to talk about landslides and tsunami hazards at Volcanic Island, insights from historical events and future challenges. So with this word, um, we are welcoming you virtually to Haifa and the podium is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you, thank you for inviting me. Um, yeah, it's great to uh, come today. And um, what I'll now do to get, to get started with the talk, I'll share, share screen. Um, so you should now be able to see a PowerPoint slide. Um, and I'll just get that going as a slideshow. So yeah, thanks again um, for that introduction and thanks for inviting me to this seminar series. Um, and I'm very happy to answer any questions on this. So do please put questions in the chat um, and I'll, I can answer those as we go along if I see them, but otherwise um, at the end. Um, and what I want to talk about today um, is building on research I've been doing, I guess over the last 10 years now, um, trying to understand landslide processes around volcanic islands. So volcanic structures in general are highly um, unstable on a long time scale and really a ubiquitous process at volcanic constructions is their failure, their periodic failure um, in large landslides that we call lateral collapses. And these lateral collapse events have been observed across all tectonic settings um, and many types of volcanic landfall. And of course, in island settings, these have the potential um, to additionally cause tsunami hazards because of the displacement of water that takes place um, and is driven by the failure of the volcanic structure. Now, these, this particular type of volcanic hazard um, is not particularly well understood. And I think part of the reason of that, um, for that is that we haven't had many events that we've been able to observe or investigate in detail because these are globally relatively infrequent. Um, so I'm gonna to focus today on two particular historical events. Um, one in Papua New Guinea, at a volcano called Ritter Island, which was mentioned just now by Nicholas, um, and, and one um, at Anak Krakatau in Indonesia, which happened um, very recently in 2018. And that picture um, on the, this slide is, is from Anak Krakatau. And you can see the state of that volcano uh, which is this volcanic island here um, among a larger group of islands um, which make up the Krakatau volcanic complex. Um, so this, this island of Anak Krakatau in December, December the 22nd, 2018, around half that island um, failed in a major landslide and collapsed into the, uh, onto the surrounding seafloor. 
generating a, a damaging tsunami around the Sunda Strait, which is between Java and Sumatra in Indonesia. So you can see the, the after effects of that and how dramatically this reshaped the island. Around 50% of the island subaerially has disappeared. Um, and around a fifth of a cubic kilometer of rock was mobilized in a single event. So it's these, these types of processes that we want to understand in more detail. And we want to understand them in terms of being able to anticipate future events, um, to identify the factors that lead to these um, instabilities and how we might better monitor and understand um, their timing. Um, because really that, that's the, the major outstanding challenge is that this particular event in Indonesia um, was not recognized in terms of its incipient processes that led to failure. And indeed the first signal that this event had taken place was the arrival of the tsunami on the shorelines of Java. Um, so there was no knowledge that this failure had taken place until that tsunami hit nearby shorelines. Um, so this is a, a major challenge really in how we can um, better understand the timing of these and put in place strategies to potentially identify these before they fail or as they fail rather than um, only being able to understand them after the event, as we are doing in this case. So just to mention, as, as I said, volcanic lateral collapse. This is um, quite a complex volcanic hazard in that there's no common single trigger that drives these, these failures. They may be associated with volcanic eruptions, but some are not. Um, they take place on all types of volcanoes. Some are very deep seated and, and larger. Um, some may be more, more shallow seated and more superficial as landslides. Um, and there's likely a whole range of factors linked to the internal structure of a volcano, um, hydrothermal systems and alteration um, and volcanic activity that, that governs the timing and nature of these. So these are complex processes to understand and not simple to sort of um, identify a signal that might indicate the potential um, for a collapse. Now, one of the best known events um, and one of the events I think that really led to a, a better understanding of the potential for volcano instability was the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980, which in this particular instance was directly driven by a, a fresh magmatic eruption. So the intrusion of magma into the volcanic structure, which destabilized that structure and ultimately led to its failure. So, but this, you know, not, not all volcanic lateral collapses proceed in a similar way to the Mount St. Helens events, um, event, and this complexity presents a challenge for how we can um, better monitor volcanoes for this type of hazard. Now, so just to reiterate that this is a widespread process, I just put some examples up here. Um, and, and these, first of all, just show some cross sections at the top through volcanic structures. Now, Socompa is a, a subaerial volcano. It's in Chile. It um, doesn't pose any tsunami hazard. But just to illustrate how deeply these events can cut through the volcanic structure. So you can see this cuts right back behind the central vent and right towards the base of the volcanic landfall. Um, we can look at a, a smaller example, but morphologically quite similar, at Ritter Island in Papua New Guinea. And this is a historical event took place in 1888. Um, and this removed between two and four cubic kilometers of material from the volcano in a single event. And this was tsunami generating. Um, as I say, these occur on all types of volcanic structure, um, and some of the best known are actually around ocean island groups in hotspot settings. So somewhere like the Canary Islands or Hawaii. Um, so there's been some extremely large volume failures in ocean islands. We can see an example here from El Golfo in the Canary Islands um, and a map of that deposit below. Um, and then some other maps, um, again, offshore ocean islands where seafloor mapping has revealed the presence of these very large scale landslide deposits. And really, High resolution mapping around any volcanic island um, or seismic reflection data sets will generally reveal these types of large landslide deposits. They are widespread and clearly they happen in the long term history of these islands. 
So at any one island, they are not frequent events. They might happen with recurrence intervals of hundreds of thousands or, or even millions of years in some instances, but, but they are widespread. Um, and there is the potential at any island setting really for this type of volcanic failure. So globally, these have not been particularly frequent. Um, if we look at tsunami generating volcanic landslides on the scale of around a tenth of a kilometer, cubic kilometer to perhaps around five cubic kilometers, historical data sets suggest that these occur around once per century, somewhere globally. Um, so we don't have many events that we can learn from. Um, some of those historical events are summarized here on this table. So you can see um, the Ritter Island example that I've mentioned, which is the largest historical failure, um, a comparable example in Japan in 1741, and, and a few other examples listed here. And we can now add to that list the 2018 collapse of Anak Krakatau. Um, this failure was quite a bit smaller than that at Ritter in Papua New Guinea. You can see um, at least 10 times smaller in volume. Um, but they both generated very damaging tsunamis. Um, and we can see some information on the run up here. Now, these numbers are, are very variable because it really depends where, where these were measured. Um, that 80 meter run up was measured very nearby um, on, on one of the other Krakatoa volcanic islands about two kilometers away from the source. Um, these tsunamis characteristically decay very rapidly in their amplitude um, with distance, but they can still be very damaging on, on local to regional shorelines. So the, the Anak Krakatoa event is important because it's really the first one where we have good observations of the buildup to the failure. We understand this volcano's activity well, in the lead up to collapse and we can look, look at its activity after the collapse and so we can place that failure in a in a broader context um, so i think it provides a, a sort of benchmark case study to understand the coupled process of volcanic activity of island growth and of um, collapse and tsunami generation so these two events the ones i'm going to discuss in this talk Ritter and anna krakatau and just again, a bit of a broader information to emphasize why, um, how damaging these events can be. This is actually from a, a study that compiled fatality data from volcanic um, events. And what this demonstrates is that um, the, the record of volcanic disasters is um, punctuated by extreme events that account for a very large number of the, the total fatalities in the historical record. And you can see some of these labels here, the Krakatoa eruption in 1883, for example, or the Tambora eruption in 1815. The, these aren't all very large eruptions, but they are um, disasters that impacted very large numbers of people for a, for a whole variety of reasons. Um, but Krakatoa in 1883, the majority of people were, were killed by the tsunami that that eruption generated. Um, and we can, we can look at similar characteristics actually for, for the case studies I've been mentioning. The, the volcanic tsunamis are capable of causing extreme and, and fairly widespread damage. And because of their poor predictability, um, they tend to, to have severe impacts. So from this same study, there's a compilation of um, specific types of volcanic hazard and their impacts. And you'll see that tsunamis appear very high up this list, um, just below really pyroclastic density currents in terms of direct volcanic hazards. Um, so although you might not think of tsunamis as a volcanic process or a volcanic hazard, um, it's worth emphasizing um, that, that tsunamis, volcanically generated tsunamis have been responsible for a high proportion um, of volcanic fatalities in the historical record. So we'll look first at the Ritter Island um, event in Papua New Guinea in 1888. Probably not a volcano that, that people here are familiar with. Um, this is today an obscure um, and very small volcanic island, um, although at the time it was probably better recognised by um, navigators travelling through this region, for example. There are plenty of records of this island being frequently in eruption. Um, it was a steep-sided conical volcano that you can see here um, and was clearly regularly active. Um, now what happened in 1888 is that virtually all of that island disappeared 
in a single event. We can see um, uh, a reconstruction here that has attempted to, to locate relative to contemporary sketches the remainder of the island today. So today this forms a crescent shaped island which is the headwall to a very large landslide um, on which most of this island moved and, and was distributed across the surrounding seafloor. Now these deposits um, from that landslide extend for around 80 kilometers on the seabed. So they, they travel a very long distance um, and the tsunami locally no doubt had an extreme impact. Um, it's clear that coastal settlements on surrounding islands were destroyed in the event. Um, and there are observations of the arrival of a tsunami to distances of over 500 kilometers um, in the surrounding region. So we have some contemporary records of that tsunami. Now, if we look at the, the seafloor map, the bathymetry um, of Ritter, you can see it here on the right. Um, the dark blue is the deepest water um, down to around a, a thousand meters here. Um, sorry, this is actually a slope gradient map, but, but anyway, the, the, the dark blue is, is deeper water. Um, now the base of the collapse here sits at about minus 700, minus 800 meters. The volcano before collapse was about 800 meters in height. So we've got about a kilometer and a half of rock that was, that was moved from the volcanic structure. And you can see morphologically that actually, if we then look at the island from this perspective, very similar scar to that at Mount St. Helens, similar type of process, um, cutting deep into the edifice. And there is actually a young submarine volcano that is building back up inside this um, collapsed scar. So all this material that failed um, was dispersed towards the um, west, um, as these arrows indicate, along the surrounding seafloor. Just to emphasize where Ritter lies, um, so it's a very small island um, between the large island of New Guinea here and this island here, which is called New Britain. Um, it's part of a volcanic arc, so we've got subduction-related volcanoes here, um, called the Bismarck Arc, and the, the island sits just here. Um, now, that what these stars indicate is, is essentially, as stars and triangles show places where there are observations of the tsunami, and any information from those observations about the, the height of those waves, um, or, the, or there are also some timing um, observations as well. So from this, we can reconstruct to some extent the nature of that tsunami. Um, and it clearly impacted a, a large area regionally. So before Anak Krakatau, this was really the, the only historical event where we had observations of the tsunami and some indication of the landslide um, parameters that generated that event. So this was a significant historical event to better understand this hazard. Um, and of course, now at Anak Krakatau, we have um, much more comprehensive observations of a similar type of event. So at Ritter, the, the map of the seafloor here, um, I, I just put up to sort of emphasize where that material traveled. This is Ritter Island itself, right at the bottom of the map. Um, a very small crescent shaped island now, um, but we can see that the landslide was dispersed um, and formed a, a, a sort of blocky um, or actually highly erosive mass um, through here. Um, and this, this fragmented very rapidly and then is dispersed with a sort of um, what we termed a debris flow fasces through here and then triggered turbidites, um, turbidity currents that, that left behind turbidites um, right up to, to distances of 80 kilometers and beyond, um, traveling over very low gradient seafloor in this area. Now the, the, the landslide processes themselves are actually highly complex. Um, there's evidence for extensive seafloor interaction erosion of the seafloor and incorporation of, of seabed sediment um, so that the total volume mobilized by this event ends up being um, perhaps even four to five times the primary failure volume. Um, so very large uh, amounts of, of seafloor material were disturbed by this event and incorporated into the failure mass um, through secondary uh, landslide triggering processes. Now we've been able to reconstruct that by using um, seismic reflection data sets. Um, and I, I just show some examples of those here. Um, so near the island, um, there's complex deformation of the underlying seafloor. Um, 
Some of this may be associated with gradual spreading of the island that preceded the collapse. Some of it may be in timing associated with the, the main collapse itself. More distally, we can see different parts of the deposits. Um, you can see this sort of irregular seabed here. Um, the debris flow lobe, so the, the reiterated deposit is in blue at the top here. Um, a distal lobe and then turbidites beyond that. Now also beneath this, just to emphasize the ubiquity of these processes, um, there's a much, much larger landslide that is revealed in the seismic reflection data from a nearby volcanic island, um, likely from Sakar. Um, and this, this is much bigger in scale than the Ritter event, um, but is now the deposit from that is now buried. So we can reconstruct with these sorts of marine data sets, we can reconstruct what took place in this, um, this event. We've also sampled the deposits um, and been able to use um, geochemical observations of the volcanic material to look at how the um, magmatic system was affected by the collapse. Um, but essentially we can use these types of data sets to reconstruct the event, um, to try and piece together the size of the primary landslide and to understand how that interacted with the seafloor sea to produce the final deposits. Um, and this tells us that, uh, and we, we've made similar observations offshore Montserrat, that the deposits from these events are typically highly complex um, and they illustrate various transformations that take place triggered by the initial landslide. So it isn't simple to link a final deposit to the size of the initial failure. Um, and, and it really requires a mixture of geophysical data sets and sampling to, to piece together that story. Um, but of course, what we lack at Ritter is really understanding what was taking place at the island in the build-up to the collapse. Um, and it's those observations that I think are really key to improving our ability to to forecast these events and, and better understand what leads to failure. So Ritter was actually quite a similar island to, to Anak Krakatea, which I'll, I'll go on to discuss now, but just finally some pictures from Ritter to give you a feel for that. So this was a basaltic volcano dominated by fairly small, um, low intensity eruptions producing lava flows, um, strombolian eruption styles, so, so fairly sort of moderate explosive activity, building up a layered structure um, and likely relatively rapidly. Um, so this was a highly active volcano. We can see from the scar of Ritter that it was um, not only layered, but, but also shot through with multiple dikes. Um, and all of this may have acted to sort of weaken the structure and perhaps determine the, um, the way in which it ultimately failed. So if we then move on to, to Anak Krakatau, this lets us look in more depth at the, um, the nature of a, a collapsed volcano. So I'll just start with this picture here, which shows um, Anak Krakatau in its pre-collapsed state. Um, and straight away, you'll notice a sort of asymmetry to this island in that we have one half, which is dominated by an irregular coastline, um, which is made up of lava flows. So each of these sort of low bait structures are individual lava flows that are stacked up forming uh, lava deltas at the coastline. Um, and these have all been fed from this central vent here, which has built up a steep sided pyroclastic cone. But there's an older part of the island which has this very smooth shoreline, which was actually built up in an earlier phase of island growth through more explosive volcanic activity, more explosive activity that involved interaction with seawater and therefore produced ash generating phreatomagmatic eruptions. So where you have magma coming up, interacting with seawater and therefore erupting highly explosively and forming very ash rich deposits. So the early island is dominated by these ash rich deposits and then later stages have been lava producing and have um, built up on top of that earlier phase of the structure. So we can still see that same morphology in the pre-collapse image here with the lava deltas dominating the southwest side of the island and the ash deposits or what we call the tuff cone dominating the northeast side of the island. And this is actually key to understanding the instability of Anak Krakatau. 
Um, and its origin, the origin of this asymmetry, goes right back to the 1883 eruption or, or actually beyond then. And you can see that the failed part of the island was that um, central pyroclastic cone and the bulk of the lava pile, these lava deltas on the southwest side. Nearly all of that material um, failed in the 2018 collapse. So why does Anak Krakatau have this structure? Well, we can sort of see that from some of these early pictures. Um, this shows the beginnings of the island, which first emerged above sea level in 1927. Um, and because the vent was underwater, the magma interacted with that seawater and produced these, what are called Sertzian explosive eruptions. Um, so magma, seawater interaction, explosive behavior as a result of that, and ash-rich plumes that then deposit their material locally to build up the cone. See some illustrations of those. Um, these are sort of very typical Sertzian style explosions. Short-lived, fairly pulsatory explosions of mafic magma, um, basaltic, bas basaltic andesite in this case, um, mixing with seawater and, and fragmenting explosively. So first of all, though, we, we need to step back slightly further, as I say, to the 1883 eruption of Krakatau. So this, this is the reason why people will have heard of Krakatau volcano. This was a devastating eruption, um, which completely changed the shape of this island. So prior to 1883, uh, Krakatau, the main island called Rakata, um, was much larger than it is today. And in 1883, activity started um, around May 1883, and several vents opened up along an alignment. You can see here this sort of um, northwest, north northwest aligned uh, vents, these red dots. These were all active in 1883, and they mark magma ascent along a fissure, um, so a sort of fault controlled magma ascent near the surface. Now this activity culminated in August in a very intense explosive eruption um, which generated a caldera, so large volumes of magma were evacuated from the shallow crust, the overlying surface subsided into that um, space, leaving behind a, a caldera structure, a subsidence structure, and of course in placing large volumes of pyroclastic material um, on the surrounding seafloor. So after August 1883, this is what the, the island group then looked like. Most of Rakata has disappeared. It's now um, beneath sea level. And particularly in this area here, that water is, is relatively deep. Um, so this is the main part of the caldera subsidence around here. We can see that, that all this part of Rakata has been destroyed in that event. And these islands have actually grown, um, particularly this one um, called Satung or, or Valatan on this map. So all this growth is the deposition of that pyroclastic debris, deposition of the ignimbrite produced in this powerful explosive eruption. So we can see the, the deposition there, the subsidence there, and the destruction of Rakata here. Now this caldera process may not have been simple, um, I think it, it likely involved various forms of sort of landsliding and mass failure, um, as well as the, the sort of sub fault, fault bound subsidence of the, um, of the island surface. Now this gives you maybe a better view of what was left behind. Um, we can see the caldera here, we can see Rakata and the, the sort of sharp cliff that marks the, the collapse of that island. So all of this part of Rakata has gone. This is the caldera left behind. And what this map also shows is where Anak Krakatau now sits. So Anak Krakatau actually built up along the same vent alignment as was active in 1883. The same pathway to the surface has been exploited by younger magmas. Um, and what they have done is they've constructed the volcano right on the margin of this caldera. So you're, you're building up a volcano on that caldera scarp, the edge of the caldera, which is clearly a, a topographically unstable situation. 
So I'll just sort of illustrate that instability and how there was evidence of it through the growth history of Anakrek Town. Um, this map shows in blue contours the pre-collapse shape of the island in 2018. Uh, the black contours are submarine, uh, um, spaced at 50 meter intervals. Um, so this goes down to about 200 meters below sea level. Um, and you can see the caldera scarp here with these closely spaced contours and the very flat shallow seafloor on the northwest side of the island. The red line is the, the vent alignment from 1883, the margin of the caldera. So if we look at Anak Krakatau in, in the 1930s, this had been active now for seven years, um, building up above sea level. And we can see already a very asymmetrical structure because material is dispersing around the vent, but on the steep southwest side, it's failing down slope into the caldera. Um, and so we're already building up an accumulation on the northwest, on the northeast side, and material is not accumulating on the southwest side. Evidence of that through to 1936, we can actually see the shoreline has retreated through small scale mass wasting, um, coastal erosion. So a strong asymmetry is sort of inherited from this process. And that continues to be there through to 1950, um, right through to 1960. Now this entire landform is built up from these phreatomagmatic explosions, interaction of magma with seawater. We can see that right through to this point, the vent is beneath sea level. We have a, a crater lake, or, or just a, a seawater sort of crater structure. Um, but regardless, we've got interaction of magma with seawater um, right through until 1960. And because of that interaction, we have explosive volcanism. Now, after 1960, the island had built up high enough that the magma no longer interacted with seawater. Now, because of that, it did not erupt explosively or not powerfully explosively in any case. Um, and then for, therefore could reach the surface and feed lava flows. So there's no change in the magma composition, just a change in whether it's interacting with seawater or not. Once it's not interacting, it will come out and form lava flows and moderate explosive activity will build a, a, a pyroclastic cone around the vent, but it's not this ash rich, powerful explosive activity that preceded 1960. So we can see the change there. Um, the lava flows then start building up the coastline. And because of the prior topography, those lava flows can only flow out onto the southwest side. Um, they'll flow down slope. And so they're restricted to the steep sided, unstable side of the island. So all these lava deltas built out to the southwest. And we can see the state right up before, before the island failed in 2018. So we can just try to sort of map that out either side of the red line on the northeast of the Caldera Scarp, rapid growth through to 1960, and then not much further growth. On the southwest side, limited growth through to 1960, and then actually the lava deltas cause the island to grow on that side. So we've got two stages, two very clear stages to the formation of the island. Now this view hopefully makes that clear. We can see the early island here through to 1960 and the later material here, which is restricted, topographically restricted onto the southwest side. This view, by the way, is now looking south. So it's sort of the opposite direction. So if we take a cross section then through the island structure, this is sort of roughly the form of Anak Krakatau. It's perched on this caldera scarp. It's building up through to 1960 with this asymmetrical form. And then the subsequent material is loaded onto that um, steeper side. And all of this material then failed. So clearly this sort of um, fairly simple reconstruction of growth gives us a clear understanding of, of why it failed in this way. So this sort of structural asymmetry was, was obviously important um, at Anak Krakatau in understanding its failure. Um, it's not typical, of course, of all island volcanoes, um, but there is some evidence at Ritter, for example, that it was spreading preferentially on one side. 
Um, and it's likely that understanding these long-term growth patterns and evidence of defamation is important in understanding where a volcano will fail and the magnitude of that failure. There is some evidence of that. If we look with hindsight at, at Anak Krakatau, um, there is evidence that those lava deltas were moving um, gradually. We don't know for how long for, um, there's not a long data set on this, um, but this side of the volcano appears to have been deforming um, in the direction in which it ultimately failed. Now this deformation took place during a phase of eruption. Anak Krakatau was erupting very frequently, built up very rapidly um, over 90 years or so. And those pre-collapse eruptions were not really different in style. There was no evidence for a dramatic shift in behavior. Um, so no clear signal that the magmatic activity itself was varying and might have triggered this collapse. Um, now this, this basal figure then shows the, a timeline of that 2018 eruption. So the, the black curve is a proxy for the um, eruption rate, essentially, the output from this volcano. Um, and we can see from July, uh, from late June, it was erupting quite intensively. Um, that rate was going up and down, but we can see that it peaked in around September um, and was then actually declining. The red just shows the cumulative curve. Um, so it was declining after about September with the odd spike. Um, but the collapse was in December, 22nd of December. So it's not, it's not clear that the volcano was sort of building up to this collapse or that there's a coincidence between the timing of the collapse and the most intensive phase of this particular eruption. So no clear indicator here really that the, the timing of the collapse could be indicated by the, the volcanic activity that was taking place. Nothing in particular changed apparently in terms of the behavior of the volcano, um, but it reached a point in December where, where failure occurred, a critical point of, of slope instability. Now the collapse itself was followed by powerful volcanic eruptions. You can see pictures of those here. Um, the vent was cut beneath sea level. And so we went right back to phreatomagmatic behavior, seawater mixing with magma. So right after the collapse, these powerful Surtsean eruptions. Um, and these early photos are, are quite important actually for allowing us to reconstruct the landslide scar because very quickly, these Surtsean explosions buried the landslide scar, they infilled much of it and the island grew very rapidly. Um, obscuring the landslide so rapidly, in fact, that you can see from the 23rd to the 30th of December, um, the landslide scar is entirely obscured. Um, powerful activity, all this ash being generated, um, infills much of the scar. And by early January, the volcano looked very much like it did in the 1950s. Um, this ash generating eruptions had um, resurfaced much of the island and then filled the scar. So these, these early pictures are really key to understanding the, the dimensions of this landslide and the failure plane. Now we also wanted to explore this volcanic activity to see if there was any shift in the, the nature of the actual magma that was ascending towards the surface. Could there be some shift in the, um, the nature of that material, was there evidence of fresh magma input, for example, that may have triggered the collapse? If that was the case, this might have provided a monitoring signal that we could use to um, suggest that something would be recognizable in increasing the, the risk of failure. So we, we wanted to sample and um, examine these deposits that spanned the timing of the collapse. Now, first of all, just to emphasize from the geophysical signals, um, so seismic data sets, infrasound, um, observations of the eruption plume. None of these signals really suggest that anything, any change in behavior preceded the collapse. The volcano was erupting in its usual Strombolian way um, through to the precise timing of collapse on December the 22nd. And it was only after that point that the, um, there are observations of a powerful explosive plume um, and seismic observations of the collapse itself. So no strong indication in the monitoring data of a shift in activity until the collapse. 
and, and then those, those other signals come in. So these deposits um, produced following the collapse itself, um, we, we sampled during field work um, and we've then studied to try to piece together the, the behavior of the magma system that built up to this failure and, and that immediately followed it. These deposits are from nearby islands. So these Sertsian plumes deposited ash widely um, on the surrounding islands. So you can see an example of those deposits here. These are well bedded ash fall deposits. Um, there's a soil at the base of the sequence and then a tsunami deposit um, generated by the event itself. So this is marine sand um, and then several layers from individual explosive events from those few days after the failure. Um, and all I show here is just some, some grain size data and so there's nothing in particular to take note of other than the fact we've been able to sample this material and two key sequences that we um, have gone on to study in depth are this U10 sequence here, um, which is in the direction of that Sertsian plume, and then a sample called U23 here, which is very different in its properties um, from the U10 sequence. And our inference is actually that the U23 sample is from the explosion that accompanied the collapse and which generated a very high level plume. Um, and, and that is very distinct from the Sertsian behavior, which followed the collapse um, from seawater interaction after the event. Those deposits are not just different morphologically. Um, you can see that morphological difference here. The, the U23 syn collapse um, material is, is very glassy, um, highly vesiculated and sort of irregular in its class shape. Um, and the, the Sertsian deposits are very mixed. Um, they include a lot of altered material and so on. Um, these differences then come out in terms of class properties. So this is um, just some data that shows the morphology of those ash grains um, for a particular grain size fraction. Um, and you can see they occupy different space in terms of those um, morphological parameters. And there are differences in things like the micro crystallinity of these ashes. So the, um, the size of the crystals that form in the magma and their shape and indeed their chemistry um, can tell us something about the rate at which magma was ascending through the system um, and the growth of these crystals through that ascent process. Um, and again, there are clear differences between the magma that we're inferring to be syn collapse and indeed some of the pre-collapse magmas that we've examined um, and the post-collapse Sertsian sequence. So those are differences in things like the chemistry of these microlites. So this is the composition of the plagioclase, um, which are the gray crystals here. Um, they occupy a much broader compositional range um, in the post-collapse material than they did in the, the pre-collapse and earlier material. Um, and we can use this sort of data um, to um to, to model the rate at which um, these magmas ascended towards the surface um, so the mean ascent rate um, and what this suggests is that the the syn collapse magma actually had ascended slowly um, in under pre-collapse conditions if you like so this was the magma that was feeding the strombolian eruptions and then was just exposed by the collapse so the failure occurred and this magma that had ascended under normal conditions, if you like, was suddenly depressurized by that landslide and then it exploded instantaneously in response to that depressurization, into the response to the removal of three, four hundred meters of rock um, from above it. The subsequent Sertsian magma then shows a, a rapidly increasing ascent rate um, that then gradually recovers again. Um, again, likely in response to the depressurization of the conduit that was feeding all of this activity. So this, these collective observations um, suggest to us that the, the impacts are a, a consequence of collapse, but actually we don't see clear evidence of a shift in behavior in the buildup to the collapse. So rather we can explain these observations by decompression 
driven by the landslide and affecting the underlying magma system and therefore initiating rapid ascent, elevated activity that then rebuilt the island very quickly. Um, but we see this more as a consequence rather than a cause of the collapse. So that's uh, important because it, it implies actually that there wouldn't have been a clear monitoring signal in terms of the magmatic behavior that triggered the event. Rather, the event was a, a gravitational instability that might have had a range of, of causes um, and that led to this change in eruptive behavior. Um, this unfortunately implies that there's, there's not a sort of a single signal, a magmatic signal that we can pick out and say this might have been used to identify the, the timing of failure. Now, just to sort of further test this idea and just to finish um, thinking about how the collapse itself occurred and how we can reconstruct it. Um, colleagues have also worked on marine data sets um, to reconstruct this event. Um, this is some seafloor uh, mapping um, from after the event. So this uh, sort of irregular seafloor here, this is the landslide deposit from 2018. We can see some very large blocks in there. This hasn't disaggregated to a large extent. Um, uh, a, a sort of oblique view might make that more clear. You can see these steep sided blocks dispersed on the seafloor and Anak Krakatau is up here. So these have all traveled down the flank in this direction. And this is the front of the landslide deposit. Seismic reflection profiles through that, um, maybe show that more clearly. Um, you can see these large blocks um, that form the main deposit, um, perhaps the debris flow running out in front of that. And much of this is also buried by that rapid post-collapse activity. So collectively, this sort of data, again, has allowed us to reconstruct the event, um, to identify the volume of the failure and to estimate the submarine failure plane. Um, and I say estimate because actually it was buried so quickly, um, it's hard to precisely constrain the collapse volume because of that. Um, and so we've used this estimate to feed into tsunami models um, and reconstruct as best as possible the limits of the landslide, um, the position of the scar, the submarine extent of the scar. And these are, these are different scenarios put forward here in these different colors. And we've modeled each of these um, to try to fit them to the tsunami that was generated. So you can see a cross section here through the edifice and those different submarine failure planes that we've tested. Um, they all produce relatively similar results, although the, the smaller cases fit slightly better with the tsunami observations. So just finally to show some of that modeling and give an impression of the tsunami that was generated. Um, and this, this model, of about a fifth of a cubic kilometer does fit very well with the, the main observations of the tsunami. Um, so clearly this is a, a simplification of the failure mass, but it, it um, assumes a failure in a single stage, um, generating a wave that then radiates outwards to the southwest. These islands are where the run-up was 80 meters. Um, and we verified this with field observations. You can see the run-up scar um, to about 80 meters on both these islands complex interaction with the surrounding shorelines of these local islands. Um, and you can see the decay in the, the wave, the, the, the leading wave amplitude um, from this source. Now this three-dimensional initiation model of the tsunami is then fed in to a propagation model. Um, this is work done by colleagues at, at Rhode Island. Um, and they, they use this to then go into a, um, a propagation model to, um, to model its uh, extent across a broader area, which is what is shown on the next slide. So after a, about five, six minutes, um, this is the, the form of the, the tsunami that's generated. We can see a wave height um, of up to around 10 meters to the southwest. And this then propagated through the Sunda Straits very strong influence of the water depth here on propagation. So the shallow part of the Sunda Straits lies here and you can see the water gets rapidly deeper to the southwest. So you'll notice that this means that the wave amplitude is maintained um, and actually guided towards southwest Java in this direction, whereas um, there's a, a loss of energy and a decrease in wave height um, 
in this direction. So you'll see that when this is played forwards, uh, we can see the red colors maintained, particularly in this area, which is where the tsunami impact was most severe. Um, and again, complex coastal interactions um, and the highest run ups, in some cases exceeding 10 meters, were in this area of the shoreline here. So as the tsunami reached shallow waters, the, um, the run up and inundation characteristics were most severe um, in some of these areas here, which is where the worst impacts were. Um, and you can see that, look, I just show this as one example. Um, we've been able to test this against wave gauge data and observations, or tide gauge data and observations rather. Um, and the model outputs are shown as the colored dots here. The actual observations are in black and there is, is generally a good fit, which is consistent with a landslide source of about a fifth of a cubic kilometer failing in one go. Um, and the landslide can entirely account for the wave characteristics. So just to summarize the insights then. Um, so the ANAC correct tower event doesn't have a simple link to eruptive activity, um, but both Ritter and ANAC occurred at volcanic islands with high magma output and likely rapid edifice construction, so rapid buildup of the volcano. There are pre-existing structural controls on, on the, the size of failure, the direction of failure, and therefore deformation signals are likely to be informative and important in understanding instability. The event shows that rapid, that large scale, sorry, failure can occur rapidly, very rapid onset um, with, with very limited sort of warning of that. Um, and the immediate precursors are not clear. So it's important to understand this long-term instability. Now, just a, a final comment then, what, what challenge this poses for the future, because clearly we can learn this about the collapse after it's taken place. And really the challenge then is to look for future scenarios and where future sites of instability lie. This is Anna Krakatoa broadly as it looks today. Um, future activity will build up this island again, and it may well be prone to failure, to future failures. Um, so it's important that we sort of better understand this um, building forwards, not just at this island, but also at other possible sites of instability. Clearly in, in Indonesia, in the um, southwestern Pacific, there are many other island volcanoes, um, which are possibly future sources of these types of event. So there's a need to better understand this instability and other potential scenarios at other island sites, um, a need to consider which monitoring approaches can detect these instabilities. Um, to examine the potential for warning systems. So if, if a landslide has occurred, um, what is the, the best strategy for issuing warning? Those, that, those waves arrived on Java within about 30 minutes. So that's the, the time scale on which warning um, must or, or would need to be put in place. Um, and there's also a more general need for an improved understanding of what drives these instabilities and controls the timing of failure. Okay, so that's uh, that's the end of the talk. I'll finish there and um, maybe stop sharing slides, and then we can see if there's any questions. Thank you very much, Seb. Um, really appreciate very much this enlightening uh, talk. Um, so I'm opening the podium for um, students to and other guests to ask questions. Somebody. Uh, could I ask a question? Yeah, please go ahead, Omar. Okay. okay. Um, I just want to uh, uh, the qu the question is uh, I write this book before uh, before. Um, is there is a there is a effect of the the shape of the top uh, of the central topography is yes, there is impact to the intensity of the tsunami. Uh, I mean, if uh, we know uh, the area of uh, the the volcano is uh, is is located, uh, if we know the how the seafloor topography is look like. Uh, if there is a steep uh, topography uh, or if there is a lot of reefs around 
the uh, the area of the volcano is there is a uh, uh, impact of the uh, of the of the tsunami uh, events and another question uh, uh, the, if there is a predicate predicate between the reconstruction of the uh, the collapse of the volcano that could predict the future collapse. Uh, as you, uh, you show, there is a. Uh, we, we look from the uh, from the sediments and and from the uh, uh, from the deposits of the uh, of the of the sliding. There we know when there is a when there is the collapse and when the, after the collapse. Uh, if in if there is a predicity. We, uh, we can uh, know future uh, events of collapse. Okay, yeah. Um, no, I think those are both good questions. And um, so first of all, the, the tsunami um, sort of models, and I think, I think what you're getting at is, is there a role in sort of scenario modeling and being able to forecast which parts of the coastline would be most at risk from tsunamis? Um, given a knowledge of collapse dimensions and bathymetry and coastal shape and so on. Um, and I think actually that that is, you're right, that that's an important role of tsunami numerical modeling. Um, if we can, you can obviously model anything, you know, so, so first of all, it's important that it can be demonstrated a scenario is, is sort of a realistic representation of what might take place. And I think that's where geological data becomes important. Um, if you can demonstrate that, that Anak Krakatau is, is unstable on the southwestern side and reasonable, reasonable possibilities would be from a tenth of a cubic kilometer to maybe a, a sort of half cubic kilometer or whatever it is, you know, you could do this at any island. If, if you can geologically demonstrate the, the nature of a potential failure, then I think numerical modeling of those scenarios can then help understand what the, what the impacts would be like. And that could potentially then feed through into um, hazard mitigation strategies to warning systems and so on. Because as, as you sort of hinted at, the water depth um, is, is a very strong control on, on tsunami behavior. Um, but but, but sort of in, in more detail, the, the coastal shape um, is also a very important influence on how wave behavior um, pans out on local scales in terms of focusing um, of waves in particular loca locations and so on. So I think that is um, a valuable way of identifying where impacts would be most severe and, and making plans um, that, that build on that. And, and I suppose your second question was really about, again, looking forward to the future. Um, how can we predict um, the potential timing and, and nature of future collapses. And I think, as I, was, as I was sort of saying in the talk, I think structural information is possibly at least as important as volcanic observations here, um, because our results so far suggest that the volcanic eruption, the magmatic feeder system didn't really change. Um, and it's more that the, the change links to the overall growth of the structure and, and ultimately reaching a point of instability. Um, and that may well occur again at some point in the future. So I think through future eruptions, we really want to understand the amount of material that's been erupted, how that is loading the edifice, where that mass is being distributed, and, and structurally to understand the stability of the edifice. So, uh, so it's, it's a difference between uh, uh, other, uh, other volcanoes, there is a difference in uh, behavior. There is no way uh, we, we can see uh, same one in all volcanoes. No, I think I think this is a, a general problem with vol vol volcanic monitoring is that every volcano has local differences, whether it's in the, the style of eruption, the frequency, the flux of magma, um, the eruption rate, whatever. But you, but you can say there is a similar, sim maybe a similar behavior, maybe you talk in the, in the starts of the uh, presentation about there is a hotspots uh, volcanoes and there is a 
like uh, island arcs, volcanoes. Yeah. There is uh, some behavior is the uh, same in all of uh, in all these sections. I think all I think good. yes, we can we can certainly learn important things about general factors that drive instability. Um, but I think at the same time, there's still a need to understand volcanoes on an individual level to, to get that detailed sort of um, information on, on failure, the size of collapse, the potential timing of collapse and so on. Um, and that's true in general of volcanic hazards, which makes, um, which makes mitigating these hazards quite sort of data intensive um, and intensive in terms of sort of uh, monitoring equipment and, 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 and management and so on. Okay, thanks, Sebastian. Thank you, Omar, for questions. Thank you, Seb. Um, maybe somebody else want to ask a question? We still have a little bit of time. I would like to ask. Okay, Regina, and I think it's yeah. as well later on. Okay. Uh, if the question is connected to the first question of Omar and to your response, okay? You say that the, a proper way is a numerical modeling of tsunami waves. Waves. So um, I know how it is difficult, uh, specifically with respect to tsunami, to model it, um, mostly because of the disc its discontinuous nature. So as discontinuous propagation of its front, and actually, which physically means the saving of all the. Uh, uh, energy of propagation of tsunami while it approaches the coast. So my question is because you you addressed uh, in a part of your talk on the modeling. Uh, if those modeling for how you can you for instance um, evaluate if if the, those models are validated properly and how they are reliable. This is my question. I think, I think, again, this is an important point. Um, there have been a lot of studies that have come out after the Anak Krakatoa event, a lot of tsunami numerical modeling studies. And there is an issue here with sort of, uh, sort of potential circularity, really. You can, you can fit your model um, against what was observed and you can adjust your source parameters, your landslide source, to then fit that. Um, and that isn't really a validation of the model because your starting assumption is that the model is, is good and accurate and, and um, reflects wave propagation, dispersal, and so on. Um, dispersion, rather. Um, I think our work sort of has improved on that in that the difference is that we have reconstructed the landslide independently using geophysical data sets and geological observations. So our starting point was not the tsunami behavior, but the landslide itself, constraining the source, and then saying, well, if we use this source, do our current numerical models reproduce the tsunami wave observations? And we haven't then gone back and adjusted the source. We just sort of compared the two. Um, and as a validation, principle, I think that is a more sound approach because we're sort of independently defining what we think the source behavior was. Um, we have tried different rheologies um, and certainly the representation of that source with, with both, both a, a granular failure and a viscous fluid failure, that representation is not the same as the landslide itself, which was actually much more block dominated, so much larger material. So that, that is a uh, an imperfection, if you like, in the in the modeling. But regardless, the the sources that we did, the source assumptions in terms of rheology that we did apply, um, produced wave characteristics that fitted well with multiple tide gauges and with field observations of tsunami height and inundation. Um, so that's probably the best validation we can do, I think, for a historical event. And Anak Krakatau is, is the only validation, is the only event where we can really do that validation in detail. We can do it with Ritter Island to some degree, but there are much more limited tsunami observations. So going back to your question, I think, I think it's a really important point um, because a lot of models are 
you know, are put out there, but they're not able to do that independent validation because the geological observations of the source, whatever it was, displacing the, the water are, are not there. So, so you end up with a problem if you're sort of fitting the model to the observations. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, that's, I suppose that's as far as, uh, I, th I think what we currently do is about as far as we can, can go for this type of hazard. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I think Itik, you have a question. Yeah, hi Sebastian. Uh, thank you very much. It was a fascinating talk. It's a marvelous topic as well. Um, I'm going back to the to this plot that showed that the, 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 the collapse actually happened not at the peak of activity, but rather a few months later. And that that sort of reminds me what we see here in the collapse of the coastal cliff. Uh, people have been making measurements and have shown that the winter storms are not where the biggest collapse is happening, but rather the biggest collapses happen uh, at the beginning of the summer, uh, which makes them more harmful, in fact, because there are more people than there. But that brings into mind the, the idea that there is another process an additional process that it has, is at work here uh, that is adding to the major process, which is the storms or the, or the, or the volcanic collapse. And, and I'm just guessing here, but the, I would think that the, maybe the, there is that combination of the fluid pressure buildup. Uh, maybe with the, you showed that, the, that there is a, a sort of a, a trip of the of that side going down or maybe getting further, and I would think maybe a model that could maybe work with with all of that together could be that you have dilatation created by the major eruption, and that dilatation allows the penetration of more water into the system, and that takes time. Um, I don't know what would be the time scales of that time, but uh, you know. It might be that this dilatation related with the big event is actually the control eventually of the collapse through some agent on the way. Yeah, I so so I you know I agree with you. I think this is an important or an interesting and a potentially important observation. Um, this time lag, if it if it's a real sort of significant part of the story, and it may be. Um, it's it's a question we've also been thinking about, and and I ag agree with your comments. Um, we haven't sort of yet taken this any further, but as you say, there are various reasons to think. Well, why why would failure occur six months into an eruption rather than just at the peak of activity um, when that eruption was waning? Um, and and I, th I think the role of pore fluid pressure and of the hydrothermal system are potentially important, um, but this is not, you know, not an area that I have any any particular sort of experience or expertise in. Um, but I think it would be nice to to try to understand this in greater depth in terms of time scales, as you say, um, and deformation processes, and and maybe even to integrate it with the satellite measurements of deformation as well. Um, but you're right, clearly. You know, in some respects, the longer an eruption goes on. So this had been a continuous eruption for six months. Um, you might envisage the greater the reactivation of the hydrothermal system and perhaps the more pervasively this could sort of affect the edifice. Um, there may be importance of sort of alteration and, and seepage and, um, and sort of weakening of material. There's, there's clearly a discontinuity in this structure between the lava pile and the tough cone beneath, a, a sort of mechanical discontinuity. Um, and you might envisage that hydrothermal activity would be focused um, in this area. This would affect pore fluid pressurization as well in certain parts of the edifice, particularly. Um, so I, again, I, I'm speculating really, but I think the timing of this is, is really interesting um, and potentially important to understand how a new eruption affects those sort of longer term um, properties of the, of the interior of the volcanic structure um, in terms of things like fluid um, percolation and pressurization. 
what do you think came first, phreatic character of the eruption or collapse? What, as far as we can tell, the, the observation people saw it happening, right? Wasn't there a big uh, cloud explosion and thing before the collapse, or were they? No, not as as far as we can tell. The signals are, are that there was a big explosion that sort of accompanied the collapse. But there's the satellite observations of the plume. There are geophysical observations of the signal of those explosions from infrasound and from seismic data. And nothing, nothing clearly places something before the collapse. There are sort of contemporary signals and, and very clearly eruptive behavior afterwards. Um, the only eyewitness reports are from some fishermen um, who are in the area. It's sort of difficult from their accounts to determine that anything, I mean, they, they were still in the area sort of things. They hadn't sort of, there, were, there was nothing that sort of had had made them leave, except there is a report that the activity that day was quite intensive, so they had sort of moved away from the immediate vicinity. Um, but no, as far as we can tell, it's it's the phreatic explosions that started after the collapse. Now there was clearly a powerful explosion that accompanied it, but that makes sense if you're if you're just unloading an active conduit, you're going to be depressurizing the material in there instantaneously. Um, I mean, a bit, a bit like the Mount St. Helens eruption, if you like, um, in that respect. So, yeah, as, as far as we can tell, the sort of the failure drove everything that we've observed, or at least we haven't got enough data to say the other way around. I'm wondering. Can I say, ask a question? Yeah, please go ahead, Emily. Yeah, so the uh, situation of this volcano was interesting because it was a large part of the eruption was taking place either underwater or a place where these the volcanic uh, erupted material was quickly uh, put in underwater and this would create a pile which would have much less stability than something which was deposited subaerially because then the particles could be probably able to stick together much better so i think that that the situation of ana krakatoa is is one which is a, one of the worst case scenarios for for you want where you don't want to build and you want to be don't want to be living anywhere near a place like that because of the fact that so much of the deposition is taking place underwater where the piles would be intrinsically less stable yeah this, the situation is quite uh, distinctive i agree in that respect you've, you've got a volcano that sort of spans the the, the seawater interface um so the, the early part of the volcano, if we look at its longer history, the early part of the volcano, as you say, built up in exactly that scenario. And then eventually it became subaerial and you were loading a sort of a normal subaerial volcano on top of that earlier stuff. And, right. and the same, you know, the same will happen into the future of this right. island, yeah. yeah. But well, the other the coastal volcanoes that you showed in your, in your sketch of where the other volcanoes are, these are not uh, sub submarine. No, they're not. Yeah, so so it's specifically small volcanic islands, and and Ritter is similar actually. So vol volcanic islands where the the whole of the landform is building up from the seabed at whatever depth it is, and then eventually becomes subaerial. That's, that's uh, this is very point. different to you know a bigger volcanic island like Montserrat, say, where you've got a larger island with three yeah. three volcanoes on it. Yeah, they're not. It's not. It's not the same. We have a few like that in the Mediterranean. Yeah, so strongly, I think, is a is sort of comparable in some ways. Um, and it's, it's a much bigger island than, than Anak Krakatau, and it's it's building up from deeper seafloor. But it, right. it strongly has a, a long history of collapses. Right. OK, thank you very much. Um, if nobody, somebody has a question, Beverly? I have a 100 things I'd love to talk to you about. <laughs> I've been working on uh, on deposits from Santorini, and um, you know, I, I think it's this is a really interesting study in the sense that, I mean, one thing that I've been learning. I'm not a volcanologist, um, but you know, just working with the deposits is is the incredible. You know, I, in geology, I always learned about it in terms of types of volcanoes, but it's really types of eruptions because you know, any single volcano can 
you know, actually express itself in these different types of eruptions from the same volcano. It's not, uh, it's not a relationship like that, you know, and, 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 it, and when you have a, and so I think that Krakatoa, this is really interesting, uh, um, <laughs> you know, it's a it's a wonderful example to be able to better understand these these volcanoes from the past and what that really looks like in real time. You know, like how you know the explosion that you're talking about. Like, what was um, what's the overall time frame from the be like like the beginning to the end of the sequence? Well, for Anak, correct, in 2018. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, first of all, I, I totally agree with your your general point that. Um, Krakatoa is sort of an exemplar of this, this variety. In, in 1883, we have a devastating eruption and tsunami that is, is in some respects at a totally different volcano. Um, it, it's completely unlike the Anak Krakatoa event. Mm -hmm. um, the magma composition is very different. The eruption style is very different. The tsunami generating mechanism is very different. They're, they're, they are the same volcano, the same geographic location, but there's, there's nothing else much in common um, in terms of the style. Except what they do have in common is, of course, that the, the modern instability is, is inherited and a consequence of that 1883 eruption. And, and in turn, that's a consequence of a, um, a tectonic structure that is controlling volcanism at this site as a whole. And, and why, why Krakatoa is even there between and this sort of bend in the subduction zone between Java and Sumatra. Um, but anyway, to come back to your, your question about 2018, um, I, I think. Now, all those deposits are probably from a number of days. We can't really place on our, that U10 layered ash sequence. We can't, unfortunately, place any greater timing on that, except that we know the lowest layer is after the tsunami deposit. Um, and in the tsunami deposit itself, we've not found anything mixed in, any juvenile material. That is possible as a, a small amount. But it's very difficult to sort of really know if something's juvenile or, or just older um, material. But we are able to reconstruct something that, that's taking place on the time scale of days. And I think that's that's a pretty unusual situation for any volcanic study to be able to reconstruct something on that time scale from, from geological deposits. Um, so another but, another quick question in the, and I, I suppose, um, I, I think this is already published, but the, the tsunami, the modern tsunami deposits related to the eruption, um, do they see multiple landfalls in a single deposit from know? the 2018 event yeah yeah i don't know of any descriptions that um talk about the structure of those deposits that might show multiple. i mean certainly the deposit that we examined on on panjang which is sort of three kilometers away um is, is pretty structureless um yeah there, there are some descriptions of the 1883 tsunami deposits um which maybe have some more indications of structure in them. Um, I, I, I'm not so familiar with those, I must say. Road trip. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, everybody. I think that uh, we really need to to cut it now. <laughs> uh, we are far far beyond the time. So again, I'm thanking you very much, Seb. It was really fantastic, and uh, and I keep you updated about our future talks. As mentioned before. Yeah, 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 no, that'd be interesting. Thank you. And, th and thanks again for inviting me. So, uh, yeah, and for the questions. Thank you. It is a pleasure. It is a pleasure. Okay, have a good afternoon over there and here in Eastern. Okay. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you very bye. much. Good having you here. It's excellent. <laughs>